Sunday, and we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, and move to chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. It's my great joy to bring to you God's Word this morning as we look into His reminders and instruction for us. The title of the message for this morning is Gospel Reminders and Instructions for God's Children. Reminders and Instructions for God's Children. Those two things are woven together so that we may understand that these are not optional things, but clearly, as you see in the text, these are imperatives given by God to His children. Join me once again in reading God's Word. 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse 28. And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one abides in him, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children let no one deceive you whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning the reason the son of god appeared was to destroy the works of the devil no one has been born of god makes a practice of sinning for god's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Father, we ask that you will continue to speak to us this morning. Whether we are here inside the sanctuary, whether we are in our homes, in our sofa, in our living room. God, we ask that your word will penetrate hearts today. And may your name be glorified in our midst. Give us also, God, the courage to apply your words and not simply hear it. God, the Holy Spirit, do a mighty work, Lord, in our time together. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the joys of being a young parent is for Pau and I to see our son, CJ, grow in uh, such a way where he starts to learn new things. And just last year, one of the things that God has provided for us is for Pau and I to teach him how to do some simple household chores like washing the dishes after breakfast, or actually preparing the plates and the spoon and the uh, cubiertos uh, before breakfast and and before the meal, and also asking him to uh, uh, fix his bed once he wakes up in the morning. And those little things are simple instructions, and oftentimes he would forget. He would say, Dad, Mom, I'm tired, I'm lazy. 
But you know, as young parents, our job is to disciple our son. So what we're going to do is that we're going to remind him of what we have instructed to him over and over and over again. Why? Because as good parents, we are called to disciple our kids in such a way that will reflect the character of God in him. That in our, remind, if in our reminders, in our instructions to CJ, it actually builds in him a heart that is willing to follow God. That in those reminders and instructions, God is using those simple things so that he may understand that as God commands us to worship and love Him, those little things, household chores, are part of worshiping our God. And like what we're going to see in 1 John chapter 2, verses 28 till chapter 3 to verse 10, we'll see reminders and instructions Of course, it's John writing this, but clearly from the Word of God, which is actually from God Himself. These are the things that God desires His children to do. And let me just say this on the onset. These things are not optional. If you are a child of God, and therefore these reminders, these instructions are for you. Keep that in mind. And I'm talking about men and women who have committed their lives to Jesus Christ, whether you are a young people, whether you are an adult, whether you're a senior, or whether you are a kid, but you clearly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, then therefore we come together this morning with these reminders and instructions. Pastor David unpacked for us chapter 2 last time in verses 18 to 27 where there is a certain sense of urgency that for disciples of Jesus, the call for us is to abide. The call for us is to stick with Jesus. You know why? Because a time will come, and I think it's, it's now, the last hour is now, that there are people who profess that they are believers, but eventually when trials and problems and tribulation and even this kind of pandemic comes, they will actually depart from the faith. That's why the admonition of John is so sharp and clear. Beloved, abide. And that's what we're going to see In verse 28 to 29, Paul says, and now. Look at your Bibles. It says, and now. So John is not yet finished. After he has laid down this this, uh, group of people, the Antichrist and the Antichrist who are actually going to penetrate, not outside of the local church, but even here inside, He is commending still the local church. He says, and now little children abide in him. And John even said that these are the things that are not foreign to the Christians during that time. These are the things that 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 were laid down before them. These are the things that were communicated to them because they were disciples of Jesus Christ. And the word abiding is something that we need to remember as children of God. If you're here in the sanctuary, raise your hand if you are forgetful. Milan? Anyone else? That's good. If you are forgetful, then therefore this message will not just ring a bell in our ears, but hopefully will be a clarion that will tell you That apart from Christ, you will not survive the Christian life. Apart from Christ, you will never thrive in your walk with God. That's why John's admonition, and now, little children, abide in Him. Abide in Jesus. Cling to Him. Now, let's just focus on the word children. Now, Of course, Paul is not talking about kids here. 
Paul is talking about men and women who are already part of God's family. Paul is talking about men and women who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now they have been adopted by the Spirit. One particular verse that speaks about our adoption is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. And there Paul says, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Friends, you need to understand that if you are a child of God, God did not simply redeem you out from your slavery, from Satan, death, and sin, but God's precious gift to you also, the benefits that we receive from Jesus Christ, is that you have been adopted. Because once you were an enemy of God, once you were child or sons of disobedience, Ephesians chapter 2, but now, God has changed the course of your life. You are now part of his family. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 16. Paul even says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Friends, you have that kind of access to God to cry out to Him and say, Abba, Dad. And that's how John approaches the text. And now, little children, abide in Him. You are not restrained anymore. You have the full access to to, to the God who loves you. So here in verses 28 to 29, we're going to see the first truth. As children of God, we abide in Christ's gospel hope. As children of God, we abide in Christ's gospel hope. Paul conti- uh, John continues in saying, Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Now, what is John trying to tell us here? Our faithful abiding in Christ produces gospel hope in our hearts. Our faithful abiding in Christ creates, bears fruit in us, a kind of hope that is indestructible, a kind of hope that when we see Jesus Christ face to face, and it's coming, A time will come now when you see Christ Jesus face to face with 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 the body, okay, where he was crucified, all those things, you will have confidence without shame. That's what Paul that is what John is saying here. That as we abide in him, as we abide in Jesus, we fix our eyes on him. We fix our eyes on the one who is fully at work in your life right now. It means as we grow in our abiding on a regular, daily, consistent manner, the affections of our hearts are pointed to what really matters. Because here's the thing. When you abide in Jesus, you become more intimate with him then you start now to let go the things that don't really matter. That's why your affections right now are centered on Him. A while ago we sang that even our song in times of the valley will continue. And that's the reason why John is saying you abide in Christ. Now, keep this in mind. The recipients of this letter were fully aware of this truth, the word gospel hope. Think about the first century believers who were recipients of this letter. 
They knew that the world they were living was not a safe place to be a Christian. They knew that persecution and opposition will continue to increase. The reason why John was in Patmos is because he was propagating the gospel. And somehow, that was actually a way for them to hinder the advance of the gospel. But the truth of the matter is that it actually hindered John. They knew that that false teachers are going to rise inside the local churches. They knew that many so-called Christians who once professed Christ are going to abandon the faith. They knew that to aspire growth in knowing and delighting in Christ is hard because of the residual effects of their sin. They knew that there will be an increase of spiritual conflict in the world. Yet, their hope was never grounded on what their eyes can see, what their hearts can feel, what their ears can hear, but on the solid rock hope found in Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is the gospel hope that John is talking in verse 28. The question is, do you have that kind of hope today? And John says, so that when he appears, how are we going to look like if Christ appears now? Look here. Will you have the confidence to look at him in the face and eyes? I'm not just talking about guts here. I'm talking about deep, grounded confidence, not in yourself, but in your abiding in Christ. Friends, let us not waste a single second. Let us not waste our lives from worldly pursuits. Let's heed, take the Holy Spirit's call to remain in Him. John is calling us to take seriously our abiding. Because you know what's at stake? What, what is at stake is the presence of God when He appears. But here's something I'd like you to ponder. You might just say, well, Christ is not yet coming. I think so. So I will just prepare myself if that time comes. Please understand that the presence of God is not just available in the future. The presence of God, Koram Deo, is even available today. So that's why John says in verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, take a look at that, if you know that he is righteous, and he is. Now the word if is not like, uh, John is saying, well, it, it, is, it is a clear indication in the original language that, that God is righteous, and He is. You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. Therefore, as children of God, even at this very moment, we don't take lightly the word abiding. Because that prepares your heart. That prepares you to worship God even in your darkest moments. That prepares you to combat, to fight, to put to death the remaining sins that you have. That enables you to fight this drifting, this lukewarmness that you are experiencing today. If you are a child of God, you have been born again. And the one who raised you from death to life is calling you to walk with him, to abide in him, in a standard that is different from the world and the principles that are being laid out to you, but in his word. Let me ask you some few questions for you to think about. How is your abiding in Christ in the season of pandemic? 
I think one of the things our hearts can bend towards with is that we can actually blame the pandemic. Blame the pandemic that we are in lockdown and tell to ourselves the reason why I am drifting from Christ is because of this. Look here. Stop blaming what's happening. The real problem is within you. It's not outside. It has been bad ever since the fall. How are you in your abiding in the season of pandemic? Are you excited to seek Him, to abide in Him on a regular daily basis? Or are you more excited on other things? I'm not going to mention those things, but for sure. The thing that excites you in the morning is something that you actually cling and abide to. Hear God's call for you today. Son, daughter, abide in me. As children of God, we are called to abide in Christ's gospel hope. Second, take a look at chapter 3, starting at verse 1. I'd like you to see that as children of God, we marvel in God's love. We marvel in God's love. In ESV, the English Standard Version, it starts with the word see. In other translation, it starts with behold. Beholding. See. So what, what John is trying to put here is that aside from the hope that we have in the future and the hope that we have also in, have in the present, uh, aside from that hope, John actually gives us another reminder to ponder on, another motivation to live a godly life, an incentive of being a child of God. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. John is calling us to behold the immeasurable love of God. Now again, the recipient of, of, of this letter is, is familiar about the love of God. But John is not giving like an assumption that these men and women already knew it. But he's saying, see again, behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us. The word love there is what we call the agape love of God, which actually invites you into a feast. This agape love of God is God's volitional love that He, of His own free and uninfluenced choice, has been given to His children. Think about that. When was the last time you pondered on God's love towards you? Let me provide you some text. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in why, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've heard that many times. But my question is, are you in awe whenever you hear, whenever you ponder, whenever you reflect on the very love of God towards you? That this love was not influenced because of your goodness. That this love was not influenced by the things that you're going to do in the, the future. These things are the very character of God laid down to His children. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. What is the motivation of our God in adopting us, in saving us? 
That even despite of our continuous rebellion and disobedience to God, He chooses to love us. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. Brothers and sisters, marvel in God's immeasurable, amazing love. I'll be honest with you. It's easy to fall into emotions that are not rooted in God, especially in this season. But when we gaze on His steadfast love and His written word, oh, we are quickly reminded that our worship towards Him is not subjective. That our worship towards our God is fueled by the very love that He bestows to us. And John continues, that we should be called what? Children of God. So see that? So it's not like God is like placing a family picture in your home and says that you are a child of God, you're part of the family. No, 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 no. It's more than that. What, what John is trying to place here is that the very foundation of our adoption to, to Jesus or to God is based on His character of love. Brothers, sisters, hear me on this. Never, ever, ever think that you deserve to be a child of God. Remind yourself that despite of your sin, rebellion, and disobedience to God, He chose to love you. 1 16th century English Puritan named Thomas Manton said, it was a free love. It's God saying, I will love them freely. God has not inclined hereunto by our worth, but out of his own free love, was graciously pleased to call us with an holy calling and give us a new being and an holy nature that being regenerated or being born again, we might be adopted, that so might love us tenderly as His children and seek our felicity or happiness. So when you ponder, when you marvel on God's amazing love to us, you don't see yourself but you see the immeasurable weight of His love towards you. Friends, marvel in the depths of God's love for you. God wants us to enjoy Him, to delight Him, feast and dine in His love. And we continue in verse 1 of chapter 3. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Now, Yes, we, we, we celebrate together about the reality of who we are now in Christ, that we are children of God. And that happiness and that joy within should actually propel you to abide in Him. But please prepare yourself as well. Because this world does not know God. Therefore, you will experience persecution. Therefore, you will experience opposition. The word world there means cosmos, unbelievers, similar to how John actually used it in John chapter 1. Yes, we are children of God. We are considered aliens, foreigners, exiles in this world because the world does not and will never recognize God. So don't look for approval in this world. Do not look for true love in this world. Do not look for, for significance in this world. See what kind of love the Father has given you. It's there. It's in Him. 
Then in verse 2, John continues, Beloved, we are children. We are God's children now. A present reality. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. And here's what John is trying to tell us. That in Christ, we are God's children now. And that like what I said in verse 28 to 29, God and His love will actually usher you and is preparing you that when He comes, we shall be like Him. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 49. And hear how Paul says about the future glory that we have in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 49. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. That's what John is talking in 1 John chapter 3. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must be put on the imperishable and this immort- mortal body must put on to immortality. Brothers and sisters, we are now declared children of God if you are in Christ But what God has prepared for you in the future is something also that we need to be excited. Why? Because when Christ comes, our body will be glorified. There will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more pandemic, no more pain, no more opposition, no more persecution. But we will be like our God. Of course, it's not in a sense where where it's like, uh, how the Mormons would think that we would like uh, be God, because when when we meet Him, you think about this. Of even though we have a glorified body, but we continue to learn more of who God is. We continue to see God's love for us, and that's what John is actually giving a glimpse to those who are in Christ. Look here. Does this excite you? Or you're just saying to yourself, I hope that this pandemic ends. I hope that this vaccine ends. It's like a silver bullet, a magic thing that everything will simply be gone. Brothers, sisters, abide in Christ's gospel hope marvel in his great love for you because that will carry you that will walk you through this life lastly as children of god we exhibit a distinct life marked by the gospel as children of god we exhibit a distinct life marked by the gospel. When I talk about the word distinct life, it means a righteous life, holy living, committed to it, that is marked, shaped, and saturated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to warn you, the next few verses will give you a punch. But the truth actually divides. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives you a clear marker on who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. But I'd like you to understand that in verses 4 to 10, John desires us to exhibit a distinct life 
marked by the gospel. Take a look at verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. We need to understand sin is incompatible with the law of God. Sin is missing the mark of God's glory. It is without righteousness. Why? Because sin is a direct and decisive violation of God's law. And what John is telling here is that anyone who is habitually, the word practice can also be uh, uh, understood by the word habitual. It means that you've been doing this, you're accustomed to this, you, your, your, your heart is numb to this. Okay? John is telling that anyone who is habitually practicing sin shows an attitude of lawlessness and rebelliousness against our holy and loving God. Now, this is a clear warning. We, we already placed, placed this last Sunday. But, but John is precise to warn the church. John is precise to warn the children of God, not to terrify them, not to think, am I saved or am I, am I, can I lose my salvation? In the first place, what, what actually the book of First John tells you that if you're in Christ, you are fully assured of the salvation. But what John is trying to tell here is that there are men and women probably inside the church or probably those who are professing that they are Christians who are continually doing sin that only tells you that you are not a child of God. Because as children of God, hear me on this, John is not calling for perfection. We are still going to sin until Christ comes. But we will not habitually enjoy the lies of sin. Why? Because God in His sovereign work in our lives provides you new spiritual taste buds for our hearts, minds, and soul. Verse 5, You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Sin is incompatible with the work of Christ. What is the reason why Jesus came on earth? Did he desire his disciples to play with sin and try to think, well, if that still suits you, probably you can keep that until such time that you're ready. Is God trying to pet our sin? Was that the very reason why Christ died on the cross? Where he took the penalty of our sin and the punishment from the wrath of God. Was that the very reason? The reason why Christ came is so that he can end sin. So that as believers, we will not be debtors to our flesh. So that as believers, we, wish we will not... Be slaves again to the enemy. Brothers, sisters, we exhibit a life marked by the gospel. And how are we going to show that, show that in this uh, trying times in the last hour? Pray, ask God, plead to the Holy Spirit that Christ will become sweeter into your life and sin will taste bitter. Verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. That's very clear. A clear distinction of a child of God from a child of the devil. You cannot play games inside the local church. Hear me on this. You might be watching this. You might be attending right now. You might be... Uh, uh, oh, attending all our services and stuff, but if your life is not 
walking in righteousness and holiness. Again, I'm not talking about the perfect life. I'm talking about a life that is perpetually moving towards Christ. There are times that you're going to sin, stumble, but because of the love of Christ that you see and marvel that it's this love is towards you, then you stand up, you repent, confess, and now move again, abide. Is that a reality that is taking place in your life? John is not playing games here. God, at the same time, is not playing games. Are you? That's why John's admonition is little children in verse 7. Let no one deceive you. Our, heart, your hearts, our hearts can deceive us. Because here's the thing. The standard of how you live your Christian life, you measure it with other Christians. That's never the standard on how we should walk. Of course, our, our Christian life should encourage other people, but the standard that we should look and long for is the very standard of who Christ is. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul tells us that it is his desire to present the people, the church, fully mature when Christ comes. The standard is Christ, not your pastors here. Because even pastors also look to Christ. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. And verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The children of the devil, according to verses 6 to 8, has not seen or known him and keeps on sinning. Sons of disobedience experiences worldly grief. What's worldly grief? It's like, yeah, you sin, then afterwards you have a mind, you have a thought in your mind where, where you say, well, God loves me. Of course, He's going to forgive me. Then therefore, I can just simply come to Him and repent. That's repentance that is actually dead, according to Hebrews 6. Their father is the devil. He has been enjoying and practicing sin since in the beginning. Contrast that to the children of God. Imperfect. But someone who strives to abide in Him does not keep on sinning. Hates sin. Kills Sin. He practices righteousness. And to end verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And that's where the children of God goes. That's where he continues. Lastly, Verses 9 to 10. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Oh, I need to remind myself of that. I need to ask the Holy Spirit to instruct my heart. Because if I'm just going to depend on my flesh, I am prone to wonder. I am prone to leave the God that I love. But we see here the clear reality that no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Friends, the power of God's word keeps us away from sinning. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11. How can a young man keep his... Maybe this is a good opportunity for us to renew that commitment and ask for renewal that the Holy Spirit can do to us. May God be gracious. May God bless us. And may God make His face shine before us. Father, we thank You for loving us. We thank You for Your Word. 
And we thank you, Lord, because your truth divides. Your truth gives us a clear distinction of who we are, Lord, as followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, create new affections, new desires in our hearts. Awaken our sleeping, drifting hearts so that we may come to you. Help us, Lord. We can't do this on our own. We've tried this probably. It didn't work. We ask your sovereign grace to intervene today. I also ask God that you will provide strength to those who desire to renew their commitment to you. Give them fervor, enthusiasm, and zeal to truly, Lord, abide, follow you. Grant the desires of their hearts for your glory and for our joy. In Christ we pray. Amen.